All right. Well, we'll get started. People are still joining, but welcome everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us for the launch of the Civic Leadership Program. We are grateful you're able to join us today. Uh, my name is Layla Sharath, and I'm the director of the Civic Leadership Program. And to kick us off, I'll start by sharing why we created the Civic Leadership Program. Ultimately, we want to build an Iranian American community that prioritizes civic participation. So to do that, the Civic Leadership Program focuses on empowering young Iranian Americans to become civic leaders through education, funding, training, and mentorship. Um, so these opportunities support young Iranian American high schoolers, college students, and regional graduates to make a positive impact in their communities. So we've already been working towards the school. I know this is our virtual launch, but we've been working for the last six months or so um, to, to get this going. So already we have um, started our Civic Leader Summer Summit. That's gonna be over 30 young Iranian Americans joining us in Washington, DC uh, for one week. And during this week, the students will have an immersive experience through dialogue and hands-on activities. They'll even meet with members of Congress. So we're really excited about that. And I'm also excited to announce that in the early fall of this year, we'll be opening up our uh, civic leadership program, uh, civic leadership uh, credential program. So this initiative will support young Iranian Americans who want to get involved in their communities. So once students go through our credential program and complete qualifying civic activities, they will receive a certificate of financial reward. And as we open up more opportunities through the Civic Leadership Program, I really encourage you, um, please, please, to check out our website, which is iacivicleaders.org, and follow us on Instagram at iacivicleaders, and I'll send both of those in the chat for everyone. Uh, but for today, while you're all here, uh, whether you're a young Iranian American yourself or a parent, friend, or relative of one, you're in store for a really impressive and impactful lineup of speakers. Uh, they come from different walks of life. They have different experiences and are in different parts of the country, but they all uh, share two things. They're all Iranian Americans and they all put civic participation in the forefront of their lives. So for us, it's not just about being political, it's about being impactful. Um, and so for our first speaker today, we're gonna switch it up a little bit and we're gonna have our dear friend and advisor, Alan Casey. So by way of introduction, uh, he's a national leader and he's a social entrepreneur who has pioneered ways to empower people to make a difference. He currently serves as senior advisor to Welcome.us and the Partnership for American Democracy, both of which he helped launch. Um, and Alan is also the co-founder and former CEO of City Year, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, City Year unites young adults from all backgrounds in an intensive year of full-time community service. City Year has also served as a model for President Clinton's AmeriCorps program. Alan has also founded Be the Change and most recently is involved with 24 seven, the People's Filibuster for Gun Safety. I know he's gonna talk about that with you all today. And on top of all of that, Alan has also run for Congress in Massachusetts. So without further ado, Alan, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Uh, Layla, uh, thank you for that uh, really uh, overwhelming introduction. Uh, deeply appreciate it. Thank you uh, and Paya for your extraordinary leadership in launching this uh, really vital, critical, essential program. And thank you most of all to everyone who has joined the Civic Leadership Program. I'm so excited to be with you all today. Um, I have, I'm so inspired by you and your generation. Uh, I have two Gen Z children. Um, and honestly, I can't wait until your generation is in charge of our country. And you aren't future leaders, you are leading now in very important ways. Um, you are way ahead, your generation, on all of the critical issues facing our country. Climate change, I'm excited to be joined by my dear friend, Saya, who's been a leader with the Sunrise Movement, racial justice, LGBTQ plus rights, gun safety, poverty, uh, uh, mental and public health, and more. You name a critical issue and your generation is in the forefront and you get it. You've resolved the conflicts of the past and you also have this great resilience and a sense of urgency. Um, 
you know, as uh, Layla said in the beginning, you know, Iranian Americans are recognized leaders at the highest levels across our society in the arts, like my other dear friend, Ariane, who's joining us today, in science, in technology, in higher education, in medicine, in engineering, in entrepreneurship, and more. You name an area, and there are Iranian Americans leading, uh, except in one, and that is in politics and civic engagement. Part of the reason I ran for Congress is we still don't have an Iranian American member of Congress. I didn't succeed, but somebody needs to. Um, and so that's why I love this program. Uh, and I appreciate all of you as being founding members of it. And I expect at least some of you will end up in political office as well as in other leadership roles. Here's some advice I have for you that I've learned from my experience very quickly. First, listen to your heart and follow your dreams. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Alchemist by the Brazilian author Paulo Coelho, and that is the theme of his book. If you haven't read it, you should. Don't let the naysayers take you off your path. When you are young, you have the most freedom to take risks. You don't have a family responsibility or mortgages or other responsibilities. It's okay to try and fail. Uh, I frankly have learned the most from my failures than my successes. Second, Related to that, if you are pursuing a cause for social justice, and this has happened to me over and over and over again, including in this most recent project I'll talk to you about, guardian angels will, angels will come forward to help you. There is a spirit of public service of people wanting to make a difference, to act on their rugged idealism and join together with others. And they will come out, even after trying and getting lots of no's, you will get some yeses. Third, no one changes the world by themselves. Uh, I started Syria with my best friend and college roommate, Michael Brown. Uh, and so the other advice I give to people whenever they want to do something in social justice, I say, find a partner and build a team. Uh, and the Pike Civic Leadership Program is a great place for you to make some lifelong friends. Try to leave this program with at least two, three, or four friends that you're going to stay with and who you can support each other in your causes for social justice. Fourth, Find mentors to help you along your journey. I've been blessed to have extraordinary mentors uh, in, in my path. And then finally, don't forget to have fun and practice self-care. It's important. So the latest cause I'm involved with, which I'd love you all to sign up for, is called 24-7 uh, The People's Filibuster for Gun Safety. Um, basically, the idea is, you know, we have to deal with this horrible epidemic of gun violence in our country. So we are launching on Thursday. In the Congress, we will be having people testify 24 hours a day, seven days a week, until the Congress finally passes comprehensive gun safety legislation. I'm so honored that Ariane has joined our uh, leadership council and uh, will be testifying. It's easy for people to testify. You can submit video testimony. Um, Layla will put the uh, uh, site in the chat for you. Um, we're, our goal is to get at least a million people to collectively raise their voices and say, enough is enough. And I hope you all will sign up. If you're in DC, we can have you testify live. But honestly, I'm just so blessed to be with you all today and I appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. It's a obviously more than timely uh, issue going on. And I guess, unfortunately, it's been a timely issue in the United States for a while. So thank you for your leadership on this and so many other things. Um, if anyone has any questions, we have a few minutes so we can ask a question or two from Alan. And I should remind everyone that for the rest of our speakers, we also do have some Q&A time built in. Um, so I'll give all of our attendees just a minute or so if they want to um, send any questions uh, for Alan. Please feel free to put it in the Q&A. And Alan, as, as we wait, um, for some more questions to come in. My question for you is, uh, why did you decide to pursue civic engagement your entire life's work, really? Uh, well, thank you. It was really inspired by my parents. So my father was a doctor from Iran um, who uh, was a big believer in Dr. Mossadegh. And when Mossadegh, my father actually was in medical school when he was overthrown and he decided to come to America because it's a country of freedom and democracy. Uh, but he raised an interesting perspective. He said, Alan, and he felt like it was the one country that would welcome him as a foreigner more than any other. And he said, you know, 
uh, this is a great country because it did welcome me and others, but also it's a great country because of its ideals. And when we go against our ideals, like overthrowing Mossadegh and supporting other dictators around the world, uh, we run away from the values of our country and it always leads to trouble as it has. And so he said, love this country enough to fight for its ideals. Um, my mother was Italian. She loved everyone. She taught me the most important thing I've ever learned, which is every single person has a gift to give. And the way you bring that out is by loving them. And it was really uh, my parents' example that inspired me to start City. It's really because of them that I do the work I do. And they made tons of sacrifices for me to go to great schools and have great opportunities. Thank you, Alan. And we, we do have a question uh, for you that just came in. And that is, why do you think Iranians are not involved in politics? I know there's probably a lot of uh, answers to that, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, well, I'm so glad you guys have signed up. I think it's because of our complicated history, frankly, going back to the overthrow of Mossadegh and then the most recent revolution. And I think, you know, because of the current regime in Iran, people feel threatened, even who live here. Um, they have family back home. Uh, and I think also because, you know, Iranians are very humble. I mean, honestly, it was hard for me to put myself out there. I don't like talking about myself and you have to do that. And Iranians tend to be very humble people and to be involved in politics, you gotta have to put yourself out. So I think it's a complicated history, but I also think our country is losing something by not having more Iranian Americans in political leadership because that's where the big decisions get made. Um, so I hope all of you will either think about running for office or get involved with somebody who is. Um, if we can run, I mean, we are a very significant community in this country and we need to help elect uh, our peers. I'm, I'm so glad that we have Yasemin on, for example. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Alan. And that's actually a perfect um, transition right now to um, Yasemin. So um, Yasemin, Councilwoman Yasemin Ansari, she's been a friend uh, and uh, really a mentor to so many young Iranian Americans across the country, but of course in Arizona. So I'm, I'm really excited to welcome her. She's the youngest woman ever elected in Phoenix City Council history and the first Iranian American not elected not only in Phoenix, but um, in uh, the entire state of Arizona. She has dedicated her career to finding solutions to critical issues such as climate change, air pollution, um, public health. But most recently, she has been a senior policy advisor to the United Nations. Uh, Councilwoman Ansari is ready to take an impactful action at home in the city she loves, Phoenix. Her priorities include leading District 7 residents safely and stronger out of the pandemic, expanding affordable housing, keeping neighborhoods safe, and bringing high quality jobs to the area. So with all of that, thank you so much for joining us. I'll uh, give you the floor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Layla, and thank you to Paya for organizing this. Um, I have been involved with Paya for many years now um, and have seen different iterations of um, civic leadership programs for young people come about. And I'm just so excited that because so I really think that there is definitely um, in, in my generation and the younger generations, a strong appetite and excitement about getting involved with civic engagement and politics. Um, I guess a little bit more about me. So um, I am the daughter of two Iranian immigrants. Um, I grew up in Arizona, was born in Seattle. And I think I've always said this, but growing up um, dinner table conversations at my house, I think have always involved you know, foreign policy and kind of like what Alan said, I think um, have heard about all of these, you know, the long complicated history of Iran for many years, but I think all of that got me really interested in foreign policy issues and just um, civic engagement more broadly. Um, I first got inspired to um, work in, in this field when I was a junior in high school. I was um, 16 when uh, former President Obama ran against John McCain for president. And that's the first time I ever started getting involved, volunteering with the Arizona Democratic Party and, you know, uh, calling volunteers and getting people amped up. And I remember that that is really just what got me um, inspired to keep going. Um, and during undergrad, um, I studied at Stanford. I studied international relations, um, studied Arabic, lived abroad in the Middle East, and really wanted to continue working down that path, but 
long chain of events and, and a fellowship in public service led me to work at the United Nations on climate issues. Um, and then eventually decided to run for office. But I would say the impetus of one of the main reasons I decided to run for office um, was a frustration in wanting more representation. I think like many people um, on this call, when you know Donald Trump was running for president and became elected and, and things like the Muslim ban were so outrageous and so frustrating and, and it was hard not to feel powerless. And I think it was really a wake up call for me that um, representation really matters. And you know, as Alan said, while we are a very successful diaspora in so many fields from uh, medicine to law to engineering and computer science, of course, we know in tech, Iranians are everywhere. I believe that none of that matters as much unless we have more political power and unless when our rights are being attacked or when our family members rights are being attacked if we can't make a an impact there if we don't have any power to change things then then we haven't done our jobs yet as a diaspora so i've always been very passionate about trying to get more um, iranian americans involved in public service and that can take many different forms whether that's running for office, um, but also getting involved in campaigns, working in the realm of politics, but also giving in politics. I think we have a lot of work to do as a community to be a little bit more organized when it comes to supporting candidates running for office. Um, there are there are diasporas that, you know, when there's somebody running for office, there's a list of 200 people that are ready to give, you know, max amounts. And I think that we have a lot of potential given that we are such a successful community to be a lot more politically powerful in that way, if we can be a little bit more organized. And I know that this program is gonna go a long way in that. Um, that being said, you know, when I decided to run, I, I'm very grateful. I had a lot of support. I, the first people I called um, were a lot of the folks I knew through Paya and the Iranian American community. Um, I started running in uh, October of 2019. Um, for for city council in Phoenix, and um, I was elected March of last year, so it was a year and a half long campaign. Um, I was first on the November 2020 ballot, and I ran on, um, a, it's a technically a nonpartisan race, but I definitely ran on a very progressive platform um, coming from my background working on climate issues at the United Nations. I really talked about combating air pollution, um, sustainable transportation, uh, affordable housing, combating homelessness, and then coming out of um, the pandemic and a lot of uh, COVID relief. So um, very proud to be the first Iranian American elected to public office in the state of Arizona. I represent about 220 some thousand people on the Phoenix City Council. And for those who don't know um, what we do on the city council, because a lot of people always ask me that, uh, myself and my seven colleagues on the council, as well as the mayor, so nine of us, essentially make decisions um, on how to spend uh, the city's budget. And as the fifth largest, fastest growing city in the United States, you know, we deal with everything from public safety to homelessness, to housing, to, you know, development issues um, and transportation. So it is, um, can be very stressful, really fun uh, at times, but definitely really challenging and um, I'm just, you know, again, very grateful to have everyone's support here and really hope that more young people get involved. And I will say, I actually have an Iranian intern right now, half Iranian, half Colombian. Um, he's awesome. He just uh, finished his first year at Columbia and uh, he just was messaging me relentlessly and was very persistent and we brought him on board. And um, I think it's great, just great to see so many more Iranians getting involved. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. I, we appreciate your thoughts. We've got a bunch of questions coming in for you. So uh, for the next few minutes, we'll just uh, channel some of them. So the first one is, how do you think you can help the Iranian community in the US? And you kind of spoke to it even with your uh, intern. Yeah, um, okay, well, this is a, I feel like this is a cliche response, but I, I took the idea when I had seen some of my uh, counterparts in elected office, like Amir Farouki in um, Atlanta and others host Noru celebrations. So I actually hosted the first uh, Noru's at Phoenix City Hall in March. Um, I decided to 
make it a little bit broader than just Iranians, because as we know, Nowruz is celebrated not just by Iranians, but by actually 300 million people around the world, including Afghans and people from Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and, and really all over. Um, so we had a really large Nowruz uh, celebration and it was not only meaningful to Iranians, but I will say, um, given what's happened in Afghanistan and the US withdrawal, and we have a large uh, population of Afghan refugees coming to Phoenix and who have been our resettling in Phoenix, um, we had a lot of Afghans at our Noru celebration and actually had a specific partnership with the International Rescue Committee to bring them in. And I will say like, it was so meaningful to them as a new diaspora and a new population and making the connections between the Afghan community and the Iranian community. And some of that is still continuing now as we're making connections with the local Iranian community to provide some support and mentorship to the new Afghan refugees. Um, so I'm really excited to, to have done that and, and we're gonna definitely continue it in the future. Um, but it, you know, I think we had over 2000 people there and definitely was um, kind of helped elevate the local Iranian American community here in Phoenix. Great, yeah, we love following it um, here from Washington DC. And I will say if I can add to that, uh, your answer, just the fact that you exist is such a valuable uh, thing for the Iranian community. I know a lot of young Iranian Americans who've already begun working with lookups to you so much. So thank you. And that I think is definitely part of how you're helping our community. Um, our next question is, how do you think increasing civic in engagement among younger Iranian Americans will impact the whole Iranian American community? Sorry, I had a little bit of bad internet connection. Do you mind repeating that? No worries, yeah. How do you think increasing civic engagement among younger Iranian Americans will impact the whole Iranian American community? I mean, in, in so many different ways. I think the more Iranian representation we have in civic engagement at decision-making tables, it'll just, it, it makes a difference in policy, right? Whoever's sitting at a, at a certain table ultimately has influence over what is being decided. So if you have Iranian Americans working for members of Congress, for senators, for mayors, for local state legislatures, their opinions and their, um, their impact will be made. And I think just having more representation just builds understanding of, of, of Iran, of Iranian culture, of the fact that it's not this kind of scary far away place. And I don't know, I think, I think it's, it's not necessarily gonna be the most explicit differences, but it will make a difference in policy and in building that understanding. I mean, I think even just like me hosting this Noru celebration, for example, builds awareness even amongst like my own colleagues or other elected officials in Arizona and understanding, oh, okay, like this is what Noru's is. Like nobody knows what Noru's is, right? But here's what Noru's is about. Oh, cool, we're seeing Iranian dance and Iranian food and, and just building that um, is, I think is really, really important. And I would just like to see more young Iranian Americans in those positions, whether they're elected or supporting elected officials, because it will result in, in things like this that will make a difference in the long run. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. We, again, we really look up to you. You're such a shining example of why young Iranian Americans getting involved. I remember, you know, working with you so many years ago um, and look at you today. So we're hoping to find a lot of uh, Yasmin Ansaris through our civic leadership program. Thank you. Thank um, and you. It's great. And the, this actually transitions very well to actually our next speaker, uh, Saya Ameli Hajebi. She is a also a young um, climate focused woman of Iranian descent. She's a student at uh, Tufts University and um, she's worked with a variety of climate justice groups, including the Sunrise Movement and the Boston Climate Strike. So is also the co-founder and director of the Academic Parity Movement, which is a nonprofit organization whose purpose is to advocate for students who experience academic discrimination violence and bullying with uh, the help of legal professionals, psychologists, researchers, and legislators. And most excitingly for me, Saya is also gonna be working with me as a staff member for the Civic Leader Summer Summit um, in, in about a month in July. So without further ado, Saya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Layla. I'm definitely very excited for the summit coming up um, in a couple of weeks. 
Um, so I think actually kind of going back to um, what Alan and Yasemin have gone over today, I think as Iranians, we come from a very strong history of civic leadership and activism. I remember my first encounter with um, civic leadership without even knowing what that was, um, was back in Iran. Uh, I lived in Tehran for 10 years before moving here. Um, and I remember during the Green Revolution, um, when uh, there, there was an election, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, um, but there was a very progressive candidate running that a lot of um, young people were behind and rooting for, and the entire co country was kind of, um, you know, mobilizing and getting hopeful um, behind um, Musavi. And when the election came along, um, it didn't it didn't go their way, um, and there was a, some debatable um, tampering with. Um, the election results, and ultimately he didn't win. Um, and I remember my entire family and the people that we knew all being so disheartened and angry after that um, and feeling like the effort that we'd put into um, backing this candidate um, and the hope that we were feeling at the time um, had all just been shattered to pieces. I also remember immediately after the fact that thousands and thousands of young people flooded the streets. Um, now in Iran, that comes at a different cost than it does here. Um, the government had massive backlash, sent people to prison, people went missing. Um, there was a lot of violence in the streets. Um, and, but even though these young people knew that that was, that was what they were signing up for when they went out to protest, um, the rigged election, they did it anyway, because it's what they believed in. Um, and so coming to the US um, and seeing that we can kind of pursue activism here as well, um, but perhaps not go to prison um, was, was really powerful for me. Um, in Tehran, I never had to read the air pollution report to know that the air quality was bad because my brother would already be coughing in the next room. Um, the pollution gave him asthma um, and it also um, you know, canceled our school days in, in the same way that snow does here. So in, in high school, that was something that I was really passionate about. Um, to me, Joining the climate movement is about the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the places we call home. Um, and, I, and in high school, I remember I was very angry that I felt like our legislators and um, kind of the CEOs of these companies that were polluting um, didn't care about the impact that they were causing um, on the environment. And so I didn't know what to do at first. Um, I was too, too young to vote and not even a citizen. So I wasn't really sure what kind of impact I could have. Um, but I also remember the thousands of people that were protesting um, back in Iran. So I decided I'll take a chance. Um, I joined one of the um, high school climate activism groups on campus. Um, and I actually um, ended up connecting with hundreds of other young people who were mobilized to do the same thing. So in about a year or so, I found myself organizing one of the biggest climate strikes in Boston history. We pulled 10,000 people um, out into the streets to strike from school um, for, for climate. And I realized that even though I was not a citizen, couldn't vote and did not think that I could really enact much change um, at the time, that I did have the power to cause 
10,000 individuals to join me. Um, and that in some ways is even more powerful. Um, I remember reading the news afterwards and seeing that uh, the legislators we were, we sent our demands to actually passed this bill um, to get 100% renewable energy in Massachusetts by 2050, um, which is a hugely forward for us. Um, so if there is any advice I have for other young Iranian Americans um, out in the audience today, it's to be proud of your identity. We come from a very strong history of activism. Um, I mean, the more recently, the, stealth, the Stealthy Freedom um, Facebook page that was released where um, women in Iran are taking off their hijab in um, to say, which is illegal, um, to show their resistance to gender inequality in Iran, um, putting their lives on the line, risking going to prison, um, and still doing that, publicizing it to make a difference um, is really something to be proud of and something to own as we go forward in um, getting more civically engaged. Thank you so much, Saya. I really, really appreciate your insight and your very unique experience, but at the same time, very much resonates with, I know so many people um, here. We actually, we just got a uh, message in, in the Q&A that's not a question, but it says, so very proud of you. So we are very proud of you always. Um, one question for you though, um, before we move on is, how can a young, and you kind of spoke to this, but how can a young Iranian American get involved in their community if they don't have connections already and they, they just don't know where to start? Yeah, um, I didn't know where to start either. Um, I remember the first day that I walked into um, my high school club meeting, I did not know anyone. It was, it was kind of nerve wracking. Um, so I would say if uh, you don't know of any of those organizations locally already, it doesn't hurt to do um, an online search and little secret, we are doing this program. Maybe you should sign up. Um, <laughs> so, and I, and I think one kind of once you take that first step, which is the hardest part, um, everything else will kind of naturally come. Thank you so um, much, Daya. Yeah. And, I, and I really echo what you said, you know, get involved with the civic leadership program will really help you um, jumpstart your interest in um, civic leadership. So thank you, Saya. Um, similarly, we're really excited to um, have Nika Farrakhsa join us. Um, she is the founder of Project 9 and the Young Voters Project. Project 9 is a uh, 50C13, um, a youth-led nonpartisan movement which connects um, youth with opportunities to engage with their state and local governments, um, completely led by young people in 47 states. Project Nine is fueled by the passionate work of its members who fight for justice and change every day. Nika is also the founder of the Young Voters Project, which is a, a youth-led political strategy task force uh, that works directly with campaigns for public office to optimize their strategy for youth voter engagement. Um, both of those initiatives empower to um, aim to empower uh, young people to be politically engaged. And then not only on top of all of this, um, similar to Saya, uh, Nika is going to be joining us as a participant, as a student at our summer summit uh, this summer. So we're really excited to have her join us now and in a month. So without further ado, Nika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Leila, for the introduction and for having me here today. Uh, and a big thank you to Ali and Yasemin and Saya for your inspiring words. I'm, I'm really so grateful to be here alongside such amazing individuals. So back in 2019, I was right in the middle of my freshman year of high school, so 14 years old at the time, and I began interning for my state representative, Rep. Ruth Balser. And one of my primary responsibilities was to write up summaries of constituent outreach and then input these summaries into our database, which basically would provide the age of every constituent who reached out. And I very quickly discovered a really striking pattern in the correspondence. Young people almost never reached out to the representative. There were 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 year olds even that were persistently emailing and calling every single day, but no one under the age of 18 and very rarely anyone under the age of 25 even reached out. And I was really perplexed 
So you can ask anyone in politics and they'll tell you the change begins at the state and local level. So if state politics were so critical, I was wondering why weren't young people engaging? And here's where the idea for Project Nine came into play. I envisioned an organization that made political engagement as streamlined as possible. Think of a one-stop shop for participation. Events, internships, resources, all compiled in user-friendly comprehensive infrastructure. And as I began informally conducting research, asking friends and family about their experiences with state and local politics, I quickly realized just how dire the state of participation was. The vast majority of my friends didn't even realize that they counted as constituents. They thought that because they couldn't vote, their opinions couldn't be represented in the state house. And nearly everyone I surveyed couldn't even name their state senator or representative. But my friends had ideas, opinions, and values they believed in. I realized that young people cared. They just didn't have an outlet to express their thoughts or access to infrastructure that facilitated engagement. The need for an organization like Project Nine, youth-led, nonpartisan, state and locally focused, became overwhelmingly clear. Project Nine was founded almost entirely overnight. There was really no plan in place, no structure, no organization, just an idea and an understanding that the issue was so critical, I couldn't really afford to wait. So after a whirlwind all-nighter, I managed to throw together a website and Instagram, and that's how Project Nine came to be. Within three months, we'd grown to an organization with members in over 20 states. And by the one-year mark, we were at 47. I viewed the lack of youth political engagement, specifically with state and local issues, as being a multifaceted problem but one that stems largely from a lack of accessibility and simplicity. My aim with Project Nine was, and always is, to streamline the process of engagement, to not only make politics accessible, but to incentivize participation, to empower young people to truly believe they have a voice. Now, three years later, those fundamental principles still course through Project Nine's veins, providing the foundation for our advocacy. In 2022, we're a fiscally sponsored 501c3 that connects youth with opportunities to engage politically at the state and local levels. We're partnered with a multitude of groundbreaking organizations like the American Youth Policy Forum, the National Women's Political Caucus, and the Girls' Opportunity Alliance at the Obama Foundation. We offer independently curated opportunities in conjunction with the programs offered by our partners, including lobby days for critical climate legislation, consulting for local campaigns for public office, advocacy workshops, and more. Above all, we strive to create a community of young people who are invigorated and united by their shared pursuit of meaningful change. The youth voice is central to our work. And more broadly, I'd argue that everything we do as a society, whether locally, nationally, or globally, all organizing and politics should be grounded in the voice of young people. Youth experience the world differently than older generations, and this intergenerational diversity of perspective should be celebrated and embraced. Give young people a seat at the table, respect and value their contributions, and really value it. Don't performatively bring them into positions of leadership. Take their opinions, thoughts, and concerns seriously. We are so much more productive when we play on the same team, when we put our heads together and organize communally. Our globe's problems have become so deeply rooted so interconnected and so systemic that solving these pervasive issues requires so much more than just one generation. It really is all hands on deck at this point. Youth civic engagement has never been as necessary as it is today. I'm so excited by the launch of Pia's civic leadership program. The next generation of Iranian Americans is really so incredibly lucky to be, to be growing up with access to such an essential resource. Thank you, Leila, Paya, and everyone who made this program possible. You are, you are genuinely really changing lives. Together, let's empower our youth to relentlessly advocate for justice and change one day at a time. Thank you so much, Nika. We are so grateful to have you and um, many of you know this, but if you don't, Nika has been so helpful in um, starting this program and we're really, again, excited to have her join us uh, for the summer summit. Um, so thank you so much, Nika. You're just always a very clear example of what um, we hope our community can bring forward. So thank you. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to move to our next speaker, our final speaker, actor and activist, Ariane Moyed. Um, not only is he Iranian born, but he's the co-founder of Waterwell, a civically minded and socially conscious nonprofit art and education company. With Waterwell, recent productions include the Flores exhibits, 
which is a series of videos um, in which artists, lawyers, activists, uh, advocates, and immigrants read their sworn testimonies of children held in detention facilities at the U.S.-Mexico border. The courtroom, a reenactment of one woman's deportation proceedings, which was named the best theater of 2019 by the New York Times, and the dual language Hamlet, which Ariane played uh, the title role in. Waterwell also created Fleet Week Follies, an annual event, a uh, festival, I should say, of music, food, and kid-friendly activities free to military service members and their families. At the Waterwell Education Program, over 250 students per year receive world-class arts training and education and advocacy at the Professional Performing Arts School, all free of charge. He has been a faculty member for nearly 15 years, currently teaching the arts uh, artists as citizens and senior capstone classes. He's also a writer director. Um, Arian has created the Emmy nominated. Stop at thriller. any time. This is getting <laughs> I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Uh, <laughs> the accidental uh, wolf produced and distributed by Topic, um, starring Tony winners uh, Kelly O'Hara and Laurie Metcalf, and many more. Current writing projects include 21, 28 More Dad, a uh, film version of The Courtroom. Um, which is going to be premiering in the Tribeca Film Festival, and he's writing an uh, autobiography about his family's immigration story. But most notably, you'll probably remember him um, from Broadway's The Humans, uh, Bengal Tiger, The Bad Dag Sued, uh, Guards of the Taj, and um, Emmy Award winning Succession in Shonda Rhimes' new Inventing Anna on Netflix. So with all of that said, I think I took up most of his time sharing the bio, but uh, we are really excited to have Ariane here um, speaking about what I think is really interesting is maybe not the most uh, typical role of uh, civic engagement, but I love how the arts and um, civic mindedness can link together. So without further ado, Ariane, thank you for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself and then I'll talk um, a little bit about Waterwell and then we'll talk about it all, I guess. Um, I really do want to hear questions from you all. And first of all, I mean, I've known Alan and how much of a genius he is in this world, but uh, hearing about all of these amazing human beings today has been just so inspiring and just glad to be involved in any of this, to be honest with you. Um, my parents were married at a very young age in Iran. They had three kids by the age of 18 and then had me when I was 35. In Tehran, I was born. Um, in that time period, I had one brother who was studying in, in Chicago. Um, and I had another brother that was fighting in the Iran-Iraq war. And I had a sister who was fallen in love and about to get married. And I had a mom and dad that wanted to leave Iran. So that's basically the first six or seven years of my life. It was just a constant, joyful Iranian stew of great memories and and fears and things that I'm still uncovering and 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 sirens and you know just all this stuff that happened at that time and we moved to Chicago and my parents um who I love dearly who are uh, I'm going to see in a couple of weeks um is they really had no English skills to be honest with you and so what happened is I immediately became the translator of the household alongside with my uh two brothers but everyone was much older you know my brothers and sister and my um are 17 18 and 20 years older than me and in that time period what happened at that time period was um, we moved to a north suburb of Chicago. I'm just going to cut to the chase just to get to the meat of stuff. Um, we moved to a north suburb of Chicago in this really kind of like rich neighborhood, but we lived in what was called unincorporated Northbrook, which still exists today, which I think people should Google and check out because I think it's kind of like weirdly not right. <laughs> um, but basically, it was an immigrant community that lived in apartment complexes in uh, that corresponded with the city of Northbrook, which is a very rich, affluent neighborhood. Um, and in this neighborhood that we were in, there were mostly Korean, Black, Hispanic, everyone was there. Anyone that was an other in this community in Northbrook was basically living there. And a lot of immigrants and and I bring all this up because I noticed that even in those circumstances and we had not many means to be honest with you as well. Um, 
there was always a, an e there was always an Iranian thing that my parents did that I think everyone here on this call can understand is that they always wanted to help other people. And my parents, as I recall, would be helping the Taiwanese couple near us or the cooks upstairs. There was an, a Catholic, I don't, they were like across from us. I mean, my mom was always helpful and I learned a lot from that. And that's really stems from, I think, an Iranian based theory that I based kind of my life on, which is um, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Many of us know it, many of us heard about it, but really have we thought about it? And at that time period, my parents were exemplifying that in this neighborhood. And, 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 and we grew up, you know, in a lower, you know, middle-class kind of vibe. And my parents, you know, were, didn't speak English. So I was the translator at the house. And along the way, I found out, and again, this, I'm 42 years old, so I'm probably talking about myself back then um, uh, without really knowing what I was doing, but I, was, I found out that I could make people laugh. And I think what I was doing as a kid was just making people laugh. And that was really contagious. Um, and that led to a life of going into this, you know, a very rich school, uh, high school, Glenbrook South, in which I had a lot of arts training um, even though we live in this apartment complex, we got access to all that. And that arts training led me to a path of art and change. Um, in 2001, I was at Indiana University studying, uh, um, studying theater and drama. And my uh, best friend in the world, Tom Ridgely, and I were really dedicated to theater and what it could actually do to this world. While we were at Indiana, 9-11 happened. And we were destined to make sure that we focused our entire lives on making sure that art is the massive change mover in how we think about the world. Um, and in 2002, I formed a company called Waterwell with Tom Ridgely, um, which is a civic minded and socially conscious art and education company that tackles complex civic questions um, in a beautiful artistic form to really get at the truth of what the matter is. For the last 20 years, we have been working alongside community members, um, including veteran community, active military, um, alongside the Iranian community, the immigration activist community and advocate community, specifically in the judges world. Um, we worked in the last show that we did, um, we worked alongside the labor, uh, uh, a movement, including Labor Notes and Chris Smalls, who came and saw the last production that we did, Seven Minutes. Our shows have been named the best shows of the year by the New York Times. Um, our shows um, really don't actually even go after theater audiences here in New York City. We actually go after um, the communities that we're trying to work alongside, not even serve, just to listen to. And that work has really stemmed into um, so much of what I believe history has bent towards us. And I'm really happy about that, though the first 10 years was really hard to try to tell the world that what we were doing was gonna actually matter. Um, again, a lot of that is from good thoughts, good words, good deeds, a lot of that from the theater world. Alongside what we've done over there is, um, we also for the last 12 years run um, the New York City Public School, the Professional Performing Arts School on 48th Street. In, um, we are a massive vendor of the Department of Education and we serve 220 students a year inside the curriculum every day for two hours with about 13 faculty members. We do nine productions a year and we're teaching them world-class arts training, but really what we're teaching them is how to be um, what we call an artist as citizen which is a class that I've been, a seminar class that I've been teaching to freshmen and high school students for the past 10 years uh, at this public school. Still to this day, um, I also teach the seniors a monologue class. Some of our seniors are gonna be, you know, the leads of new Marvel series and have won Emmys. Some of them are working at the Mayor's Office of Environmental Affairs. Um, I'm also an actor. <laughs> Along the way, I have, in, since 2005, because of a Waterwell show called The Persians, a comedy about war with five songs in which we invited every Thursday and Friday night, every Iranian in the tri-state region, and they would come, in which we would tell the, we would teach the audience members how to do Persian swears, and we had these amazing conversations afterwards, but it's, The Persians is an Aeschylus play. And just to give you an idea of how deep we try to get with it, but it's an Aeschylus play. Aeschylus um, fought in the Persian-Grecan War, beat 
them and then wrote a sympathetic play about Persians losing. And it's the oldest English play. And we took that and we, and we did it at this kind of shitty off-Broadway theater, off, 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 off-Broadway theater. And then somehow or another we moved it and people came. And then I got signed by a really major agency at the age of 25 in 2005. And I went into those meetings and I said that I won't play terrorists and I won't play victims because my parents and myself really traveled a long way to get here. And at that time period, those amazing agents really kind of didn't balk at it, to be honest with you. I mean, I just didn't work. I just kept on doing theater, theater, theater. Along the way, I did this amazing, Waterwell was doing shows and those were picking up steam. And along the way, I did this show called The Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo. It moved to Broadway. I was nominated for a Tony Award, the first Iranian American to be nominated. And then uh, after that, that led to more theater pr productions, including The Humans, which won the best Tony Award in 2016. The people from Succession saw me in that. They cast me. Um, we built this character of Stewie Husseini together. Shonda Rhimes loves Stewie Husseini. <laughs> that led to me being an inventing Anna and now I'm in Marvel. Okay, ask questions. Thank you. Shonda I didn't know how to like yeah. sum up the acting career. So I just went like <laughs> bullet points. I was like, here we go. Well, I'll also add that Shonda Rhimes isn't the only one who loves Stewie. Sue is my, one of my favorite characters oh. in Succession too. So I guess Shonda Rhimes and I are very similar is what I'm saying. Yeah, you guys are basically besties. Yes, exactly. So I actually, our first question is that is a perfect transition. And you can see all of our speakers here today represent our community so well, but in so many different ways. So why is it important to you, um, Iranian American representation in the arts and more broadly in our society? You know, you know what's really, I'll tell you, can I tell, can I answer that with a story? I'm going to answer that with in, in two, we were so, when we were doing the Persians, that play I was, I was talking to you about, so talking to the group about, when we were doing that show, we were so anti-war. I mean, that war was absurd and we knew it was absurd and we were 25 and we were like, F you to that war. But as we were playing this, doing, but we never in the, in the show, we never once talked about like how we hated that war. We didn't have to. The play actually commented on that. And then while we were doing this anti-war play, we started reading in the newspapers that veterans were coming back in massive, in massive, um, with massive PTSD and dying. And then, and then Tom and I really, really, I think the number was 27 suicides a day. And then all of a sudden Tom and I, for some odd reason, dove deep in who the demographic of veterans are. And as an Iranian immigrant that came to this country, as many Iranians here, um, and thankful for the opportunities that this country has given me, I started realizing that the majority of the people that are in the military are black and brown and poor. Um, those are one of the three qualities. Um, and so we wrote a we wrote, a, we wrote a grant application to the National Endowment of the Arts at the age of 25 to say, can we make all of our shows free for veterans um, from, the Iran, uh, from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars? And the N National Endowment for the Arts said yes. And for 15 years now, I've had this really crazy relationship, beautiful relationship with, act with active duty, and, and veterans and veteran family members that have come back from the war as an Iranian immigrant, much, so much conflict in that scenario. And um, along the way, I've made some amazing friends there. And, and, and if an Iranian immigrant and an, an Iraqi veteran, Iraqis who killed, you know, remember the Iraqi-Iran war, my family is so deeply a part of them. My, my first cousin died in the hands of Iraqis. Um, if an Iraqi, you know, one that fought in that war, a veteran there, and an Iranian immigrant like can hang out in the same room, try to make some connections, have disagreements, have similarities, I really do think that's an example that Iranians, like everyone here is what they're doing. They are showing by action. And I think that action is the better way to kind of make actual substantive change into how people view Iranians in this world. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, there's every day there's more and more um, division. So it's important that representation can help bridge that. And for you also, another question that came in is, why do you think it's important for specifically young Iranian Americans um, to get involved? I don't know who it was that said it, 
but I think we all feel it. I think we all kind of said it, but Iranians have so much to give. They have so much good thoughts, good words, and good deeds to give out to the world. And I think for us to be engaged in our communities is really the only way that we can not only change how people think about us, but how I think the good thoughts, good words, good deeds can actually change people's lives. I genuinely believe, you know, someone in, in college at Indiana University of all places said, the only things that we remember from history is wars and art. And if you start thinking about it, it's kind of true. And so as artists, instead of thinking about trying to be famous or trying to be on TV and all that, which to be honest, I, 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 I had aspirations of course, but it was so unlikely because there was nobody that looked like me when I was, who was my example? And I'm saying no to terrorists. So in that way, I never even thought that would be possible even though it kind of ended up happening. All this to say is that like we have the, we are the ones that can actually substantively change how we think about the world and how we change people's lives through art. Um, and, and I think if you think about the ways that you think about um, things that you don't know about, it's somehow related to art somehow or another. And if those pieces stop being, you know, less stereotypical and more kind of human and what we can give to the world, I think we can actually, actually make change. Thank you so much, Arian. I really appreciate your time. I know I can speak on behalf of all of our attendees and Paya and the Civic Leadership Program. Thank you so much with your work for Waterwell, for your time today and just representing our community um, so positively. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today as our time wraps up. I think it's really important for us to take away that civic participation can look like a lot of things. You've seen a lot of examples firsthand in the past hour, but civic participation can really be anything from your local park cleanup or getting involved with clubs like Saya was talking about, or um, even activism through the arts and starting your own nonprofit or even running for office one day like some of our speakers have. The Civic Leadership Program is here to help you uh, get involved in whatever way you want. Uh, we had so many new people join us today, but now you're part of our civically minded community. So I look forward to working and supporting um, you all in the future. I also want to mention that I did not um, forget that we uh, promised we are going to do an $100 Visa gift card raffle. So that will be announced on our Instagram tomorrow. Uh, you'll be contacted via email, but make sure you follow us on Instagram and look, check out our website. I just sent it um, through the chat. Um, thank you again for your time today. We are at the top of the hour. So we really appreciate this and we look forward uh, to working with you all. Thank you.